GM GM everyone, in this video, I'm going to discuss a very important upgrade to the EVM, which is EVM Object Format or UF. And this is going to be EVM's biggest change since Genesis, and I am really excited about it. I highly command you to watch this video till the end, especially if you are a builder or you are involved in the EVM ecosystem. We are going to discuss UF, which basically consists of series of EIPs and how these EIPs directly benefit the EVM. We will discuss the current execution specification and we will see an example of UF bytecode and even discuss some complexity and disadvantages. So let's get started. Okay, so Ethereum has seen substantial changes as the merge and EIP 1559 or EIP 4 blobs. However, the EVM looks mostly the same. Uh, there hasn't been an update to the Ethereum virtual machine specifically. There has always been questions that EVM is too simplistic or some more features would be nice to have. And with EOF, which we are going to discuss, it will be EVM's biggest change since Genesis of Ethereum, right? Uh, which is another reason that you should watch this video till the end. And I can guarantee you that you will learn a lot from this video, even if you are a newbie. So... Let me first give you an overview of what UF is, right? So we will discuss the current EVM specifications later, right? So the new EVM object format proposal basically aims to make the industry standard Ethereum virtual machine more developer friendly, okay? So the EUF is collection of around 11 EIPs as of now aimed at overhauling control flow, validation and execution of the EVM. And most of these CIPs are interdependent, requiring each to be included in the same art fork to be truly useful. And this has been worked for roughly around four years and is going to be included in the Pectra, which is going to be the new Ethereum upgrade. And you can check out these EIPs individually. I will provide a link to uh, all these EIPs in the description. So you can check out if you want individually. Okay. Uh, okay. So what is current EVM, like how it works, right? So basically smart contracts today have no formats and the data they contain are called the opcodes, which are step-by-step -step, uh, instruction. You can say bytes to the Ethereum virtual machine to execute and some byte represent instructions, some byte can represent data and some byte can simply be that code, okay? And one of these issues is just how unstructured this input field is, okay? Uh, anyone can put in anything and the EVM will do its best to interpret it, which is byte by byte, okay? So right now, the EVM doesn't have a way to understand a smart contract holistically, right? And it simply must read each line of code and, you know, attempt to execute it, right? And this is the effect of designing EVM for simplicity. Execution is simple, but uh, it is very costly and not efficient, okay? Uh, and there has are also some bad things about current EVM, but we can we can discuss that later. But now let's understand more about um, EUF, okay? So roughly speaking, the EUF introduces a version container format for EVM bytecode, which offers a mechanism for managing and breaking, uh, you know, breaking changes to the EVM. And this is EIP 3540, like the core EUF EIP, okay? So the first version of the EUF would basically add a dedicated data space to the contract versus right now where the data and code aren't distinguished, right? So we will go deeper into the changes later, but this is like the bigger picture, okay? So in simple terms, the proposal is to add a format to the contracts, okay? Which would include code sections, uh, data sections or functions and more, right? So basically it defines a structure of a program, okay? Like what the functions are, where the data is and making analysis and execution, you know, more efficient, right? So the main goal of the core EIP uh, 3540 is to add a format to these contracts, okay? Now let's look into an example and visualize those changes, okay? So a legacy means uh, current EVM. First of all, let me also just remove myself. So Legacy here means the current EVM. And whenever I say legacy, it means that the current EVM in EUF is going to be the EUF EVM, right? So basically, from now on, there are going to be two versions of EVM, which when I say legacy, I mean the current one. And, you know, when the, the EUF is the EUF version, which is going to come. Okay. 
So here you can see in the UF code, it introduces a header. So this is the simple legacy code, the code which is current we have right now. And this is the new UF bytecode. And here you can see that it introduces a header that we just talked about here, right? It introduces uh, specifically a header, okay? Uh, so don't worry if you don't understand it. I have another example for you, okay? So this is a basic UF contract with a data section being used to load a byte of data onto this stack, okay? Um, now let's break it down step by step. I've also provided like, uh, you can also see more examples from this link here. We can uh, go through it later. But yeah, this is basically a simple EUF example. Okay, so now let's break down uh, the EUF example, okay? I have uh, mentioned different component with different color here, right? So let's break, up, break down each and every component here, okay? So the starting two bytes are the magic bytes, uh, the deployed code with UF prefix, right? So in London Upgrade, there was an EIP that uh, rejected any contract that started with um, EF bytecode, right? And also the question is why not EF, right? Why why not just EF? Why do we have this extra two zeros, right? It is because uh, there is already a contract that is, I think three contracts that is deployed that starts with EF, right? So that's why we need uh, something extra, right? So that's why we have uh, zero, zero. And why only zero, zero? Why not zero, one or zero, two? Because it is cheaper in uh, call data, I guess, okay? Uh, and currently there is no code that starts with, uh, you know, EF uh, zero, zero, right? So whenever we uh, see EF bytecode, we can show that, uh, you know, it is validated, okay? So the next thing is the version number which is 01, which is set uh, at one currently, right? And the next thing is the header, right? So the header starts right now. And the header type section is four bytes long, which we'll we see like what it is talking, which is what is four bytes long. The next thing is uh, the, again, the header, which, which says that there is one code section, which is four bytes long. We will see uh, in the future what, which, which one is the code section, right? The next one is uh, again the header, which says there is a data section, which 33 bytes long. So I think if you already know a bit of solidity, then you, you can see here, which is the 33 bytes long, right? Okay, so the next thing is uh, the header terminator, which is 00, zero which is basically saying that the header is uh, terminated or the header is ended, right? So again, now the next thing is the type section, right? So the type section is basically, you can say it provides metadata about the code section, okay? That's that's what type section is, right? So it is saying that first section zero inputs non-returning max height uh, one, okay? Uh, so the next thing is actually the code. So this is basically the code, right? So you can see here that here, there was a header that was saying that uh, the code section is four bytes long. So you can see the code section is exactly four bytes long. And there was also a header here which says the type section is four bytes long. So you can also see the type section is four bytes long, right? Now, the next thing is uh, the data, right? So here you can, you will, you can see in, in the header in the data section, it says that it is 33 bytes long, right? And you can see here the data, which is the 33 bytes long, right? And which is basically the code section. And in this particular example, which is data load and onto the stack, the first word of data, you know, stop. So yeah, that is the data and uh, yeah, this is basically a simple breakdown of, uh, you know, EF example. Uh, in this particular link, I will provide you this link in the um, description as well. So you can go to this link and there will be multiple other examples that uh, you can check out. Uh, you know what, let's actually see those examples, okay. So uh, I am in the website, so there are multiple examples in this particular uh, GitHub repo. This is by, if I'm not wrong, by Epsilon, which they are working with, uh, with they are closely working uh, on EUF, right? So these are multiple examples. There is uh, a single the minimum valid EUF container, which is doing nothing. This is basically a simple example. So you can see the example here. And then there are separate uh, other examples, a EF container with two code sections, one calling the other. So this is an example for that. And then, yeah, there are at, at least five to six examples that you can check out, right? And also uh, at the end, uh, this one is the example that uh, we took, I guess, right? 
So yeah, you know, you can check out this and I will provide the link to this in the description. There is also some other information as well, uh, some useful information if you want to read more about EOF, EOF, right? So, but let's right now continue to our presentation. Now let's also look into EVM UF uh, taxonomy uh, as it as it visually represents like the EUF changes, right? Uh, so EUF separates EVM bytecode from data, making it easier for static analysis tools, formal verification, and L2 to process the executable code, right? So as you can see in this diagram, uh, there are 16 legacy opcodes, which is like, this is the legacy uh, EVM that we discussed, and this one is the EUF, the new one, right? So there are 19 new EUF opcodes, EUF validation, EUF format, right? And then this is the 16 legacy opcodes and everything, right? So yeah, this is just the basic overview of the opcodes, okay? And this was uh, the credit to this person. I uh, took this image from Twitter, okay? Uh, cool. So now let's discuss some advantages of how EUF is going to help uh, developers as well. So one common annoyance of Solidity programmers has been, you know, the stack to deep issue, right? And since the EVM only supports uh, dupe 1 to dupe 16 and swap 1 to swap 16 of course to swap the stack elements around, uh, you can't have like more than 16 local variables or functions parameters in the solidity, right? And this has been a very, very, uh, you know, big annoyance for uh, solidity developers that they need to structure their code, uh, you know, around this issue. Um, for, for beginners who haven't coded on Solidity, like imagine that every computer program gets like a limited amount of memory to execute within and this check enforces a kind of a boundary, right? So yeah, so although this, this stack can be up to 1024 items, item stall, but once you try to reference a variable in slot 16 or higher, it is going to fail, right? So. Uh, stack to deep has always been an issue, right? So, but with EOF, the EOF introduces dupe in, swap in, and exchange three opcodes that makes an 8-bit immediate, uh, you know, which makes it possible to have up to 256 local variables or function parameters, okay? So, these three new instructions have been added, right? So, the dupe in basically duplicates a stack item, at the top of the stack, the swap one exchange uh, like swaps uh, stack items with top of the stack, right? And the exchange swaps two items in the stack itself, right? So, however, uh, these opcodes are not uh, UF exclusive, so they could be uh, you know, easily be added to the normal EVM without the UF, right? But uh, they have been, you know, they have been proposed in the EIP before, which is six six three. Right, uh, and I can specifically create a, a long video on the, about this topic. And if you want a, a video uh, to understand what is stack to the bearer and all the stack uh, things, then yeah, just comment down and I will create a separate video on this. Right, so I think getting rid of the stack to the uh, you know compiler is one of the EUF's biggest impact for the uh, devs. So if you are a dev, then it will be you know helpful for you. Now let's discuss the next advantage, right? So the code validation at deploy time. So when someone creates a smart contract, there is no mandatory check to ensure that the code is correct, right? Code was correct. This means a contract could uh, have incomplete instructions or even, you know, undefined opcode instead, right? So EVM only dealt with issues when the contract was, you know, uh, actually, actually executed at the runtime, right? So with uh, EOF, the EVM can analyze uh, a smart contract before, so before it is deployed on chain itself, right? So if it fails any of those stacks, it can be rejected, uh, you know, outright, right? So if your contract has any errors, like uh, incomplete instruction, example, a push, uh, push instructions without necessary data, right? The de deployment will be rejected, right? So this ensures that valid contracts are only deployed, right? So, so this is also kind of a future proofing. So by rejecting the contracts with undefined instructions, uh, it becomes safer. So let's say in the future, if we add new instructions to the EVM, we don't have to worry about the risk that older contracts might break or, you know, they behave unexpectedly, right? So yeah, so to, to summarize this EIP, like EOF uh, moves a lot of uh, runtime checks to deploy time, okay? And instead of having the interpreter validate the instructions repeatedly at runtime, the EVM bytecode is basically, you know, is 
is validated only once during the contract creation, right? Providing a faster and a more secure uh, execution, right? So there are also some new new rules, uh, new deploy time validation rules like depreciated instructions such as call code and self destructs are rejected, and then undefined instructions are rejected, and then incomplete instructions like push without any uh, data to push are also rejected. Uh, so yes, the code validation is not going to be at deploy time rather than runtime. Okay. So the another advantage, I think probably the biggest advantage of UF is that the is the jump test analysis is performed at uh, uh, deploy time instead of runtime. So okay, so bit of an explanation here because not everyone uh, knows about jump test, right? So when a smart contract is running, right, it is it often needs to jump to different parts of its code to perform certain tasks. Uh, think of it like following a map where you have specific destination you need to reach, right? So jump test analysis is like, you know, checking the map to make sure that all the destinations are valid and, you know, safe to go to. And it, it ensures that when the code makes a jump, it doesn't accidentally land in like the middle of a data or instructions that doesn't make sense to jump to, right? So the jump test introduction, uh, which is top code 0x5v, marks a specific points in the code where the program is allowed to jump during the execution. So not every occurrence of, um, you know, the opcode 0.5b in the code is, you know, valid jump test. Okay. Uh, this is because the same byte might appear um, as part of the other instructions or data in the code, not just in the jump test. Okay. Uh, the picture is not fully, yeah, but it is, you know, saying, saying the same thing. Right. So this is why, uh, the jump dest analysis is required. I hope the picture is clear, like why jump dest analysis is is required. It's basically, you know, checks uh, that all the destination with the example are safe and, you know, they are valid to go through, right? So whenever it is going to make a jump, it doesn't accidentally land in the some, uh, some of the data instruction that doesn't any, you know, make sense, okay? So now, what is the problem with this jump test analysis, right? So again, following that example of the map, imagine you are following this map while driving, okay? But every time you come to a turn, right, you have to stop and then recheck the entire map again to make sure that you are still on the right path, okay? So this slows you down, down every time and this is not really an efficient way if you want to reach somewhere, right? Every time if you want to you know, if you have to take a turn, if you have to see the map again, then this is a very, very, uh, you know, not an efficient way, right? So uh, this is a similar to what happens with uh, runtime analysis. The jump test analysis is currently done every time the code is uh, code is run, right? So which takes up processing power. There have been attacks in the past where people could overwhelm the system, right? So basically a DOS attack by creating lots of contracts with complex code to, you know, slow things down, right? So which is not really good for the EVM, right? So in order to, also in order to combat those issues, there was uh, the, the maximum init code size when introduced in EIP 3860, which basically uh, introduced an extra additional guest cost for the jump test analysis so that people can't really, you know, do the attacks, right? And with and, and overwhelm the system, okay. So yeah, so that was introduced. So now with the EV, EUF, what is the scene? So with EUF, the changes, uh, EUF changes the game by moving the jump test analysis to the time when the contract is first deployed again, right? So rather than every time it runs, this ensures that the jumps only point to a valid instructions, not a random data or, you know, invalid areas of code, right? So this is going to be at deploy time instead of runtime again, right? So do maybe, I'm not sure, uh, maybe, but uh, I think the max code size can be increased significantly without running into these issues again, because uh, UF, the EIP 3860 was introduced, uh, right, to, uh, uh, so that we can make sure that this attacks can't happen and, you know, nobody's overwhelming the system, but I think maybe the max code size can be increased significantly uh, after uh, this uh, EIP or UF is introduced, okay? So yeah, you know, EF changes the game and I think this is one of the most, the biggest advantage of UF, okay? Now let's continue and check other advantages. So EIP 7620, which is the UF contract creation. So 
since EF does not allow, uh, you know, code observability, which is required for legacy creation, right? So inst instructions such as like the create or create to, if you don't know what create to and create to is, uh, I've created actually a thread which you can check out. I will provide the link in the description. So the new instruction have to be used to, you know, uh, create contracts, right? So the 7620 AP was has introduced three new opcodes, which is UF uh, create, transit TX create and return contract instruction, right? So the you can see that uh, the first one initiates a contract constant with a container, con container index. The second one initiates a creation context with initialization code in the transaction data. And the return contract deploys a contract swipe code at a container index. We have just seen all that in the structure when we were just talking about it. Okay. So now the EUF factory contracts can run, you know, EUFs create to run the code for an init container inside the factory container, which can then tell the return contract that refers to, you know, another sub container. Um, now, some other advantages as well, uh, which is the gas and code observability, right? So, I think there was EIP 7069, which basically revamped call instructions as of Kenken, right? Kenken upgrade, Ethereum upgrade. There are call, there is static call and the delegate instruction to interact with the external contract. So, whenever you want to, you know, uh, deal with external contracts, you use call, static call or delegate call, right? So, EOF also gets rid of these um, uh, gas opcodes and replaces with uh, replaces this with variants that do not allow users to specify how much gas they would like to send with the call, right? So this is these opcodes are not going to allow the user to specify how much gas they would like to send, right? So it creates like three simplified call instructions, the external call, uh, external static call, and delegate call and return data load, right? So as you can see that, it's same as call but basically it's not going to allow uh but with it will be without guess or you know return data parameters right so similarly for standard data static call as well and same for uh delegate call but without guess or return data parameters and uh, there is also return data load which removes the need to first copy the return data to memory and then you know load the value from that memory. This makes a uh, far more efficient return reading. So I think uh, if, you, if you don't know how the external cost works, the delegate cost works, I would say go and check out how proxy contracts work and you know understand why uh, the return data load, which basically, you know, it removes the need to like uh, first copy the return data to memory. This is how the calls are working. You have to first copy the return data to the memory and then, then load the value from the memory. So now this makes more sense. This is more efficient reading. Okay, uh, cool. So these new call instructions do not specify a gas limit, as I said, and but in street basically pass the max amount of the gas. And the gas observability has been a problem in the past, uh, as the the new hard folks uh, may alter the behavior of the contracts, which basically depends on a specific amounts of gas, meaning the contracts will no longer affected by the repricing. Okay, and then there also have been uh, few new status code which is zero means success and then one means reward and two is for failure and then maybe new status code might be added in the future as well right so some other advantages as well so one of the advantage of uf is smaller program size uh the added structure of uf basically allows compiler to you know optimize the way they're structuring the code which might reduce the program size by uh two to five percent so yeah this can be one of the advantages and we also have seen like uh, you know how it provides a structure to the code okay so the ef also removes the dynamic jumps which reduces the analysis to o, to o of n in the worst case and the ef also separates the evm guide byte code from the data as we've seen that making it easier for static analysis tool formal verification and l2s to process these executable code Right, so this in general, overall, it um, improves the developer experience, right? Uh, and I think it is good for developers since this uh, UF is going to help them, uh, you know, basically going to improvise the EVM, the standard Ethereum virtual machine. But I think now it's also important to discuss some disadvantages and what some other people in the industry are saying about the UF and why it is not uh, you know, too much helpful or what are the disadvantages of that. So let's go and check the disadvantages now. 
the biggest issue i see with uf it's that it is extremely complex and we will still need to maintain like the unoptimized opcode for the legacy evm like the current evm and current evm will still need to like you know be maintained in parallel like unless the ethereum community can devise some mechanism to depreciate the legacy codes right and uh, to be honest there needs to be good reasons for protocols to move from existing contracts to like the uf contract like for example there must be some signi- significant uh, gas cost reduction right even if you are a dab and if you don't see any you know good specifications or you know any good changes and any good reason to migrate from the you know legacy contract to uf contracts you will not do that effort right so there has to be very good reasons for the developers to migrate their contracts okay and uh, issue in practice i think i i see that we will still need to maintain that unoptimized opcode for the like cvm which means uh, you know duplicating a lot of logic and once with additional checks and once without right so these changes uh, you know have been uh, already resulted in two consensus issue, consensus issues which is one in uh, you know basu and evm1 which is used by ergon right and even before evm made it to mainnet so even before the evm made it to mainnet there has been already some issues right and luckily this issues were found by a developer before they made it to release but yeah you know this has been a uh, uh this has been a talk in the ethereum ecosystem and as a dev to be honest as a security researcher uh you know we will have to learn new stuff i think when e- euf uh, comes into play okay so also now there are few community members who are not happy with how euf is going into pectra and why they you know they have some good reasons for it right the main question is you know why are we actively um making layer 1 more complicated to the you know as, as this is not clearly necessary to the survival of ethereum right so because according to the ethereum roadmap and ethereum has been very clear that l1 should be simple as possible uh, to become a settlement layer and the focus should be making it you know easier for people to run the client and it's not that important for the roll up centric roadmap right uh, so yeah you know th- these have been a questions this has been a pretty much big question for the ethereum community right and few members of the geth team right so geth has is the most widely adopted clients which have basically you know they have drawn a line in the sand that uh, they are not going to block the uf the evm object uh, format upgrade but uh, they want that their support will be limited even in one of the ethereum community call i know the developer said that if it blows up on the mainnet the uf blows up then he's not going to stand up at 2 am to fix it i mean yeah that's that's uh, i don't think so he will be the, obviously ethereum devs are always going to be there to support ethereum if anything goes wrong but uh, yeah you know this shows that uh, they have a bit of uh, frustration uh, with uh, eof okay and uh, one of the other opinion is that uh, that we should leave this for l2s to implement uh, because l2s have a very you know heavy vc money so i think uh, uh, most of the people want that uh, l2s should take care of this uf implementation because they have vc's money and so you know uh, they can do a, a lot uh, more and i think uh, people think that l1 should only focus on their roadmap and making sure that you know most of the people can run their ethereum client and you know it's, it has to become like a settlement layer with roll up centric roadmap okay so you know this has been i think uh, some of the opinions of other people and they don't want um, uf to be uh, get into pectra So let's see what happens and now let's also talk about some conclusion i think we have already discussed all the advantages so we have seen uh, what uf is we have seen the structure we have also seen a code example we have seen advantages and separate eaps stack to deep and code validation and everything we have also discussed some disadvantages and also some what are the views of ethereum community members and you know what is going to happen so as a conclusion i think the uf uh, suit of eip you know it stands benefit i I, th- i personally believe that it benefit the ecosystem 
uh, despite its complexity and you know all this difficult to follow history and i think uh, uf is going to be the technical upgrades that are important to transform the evm into like a mature computing platform and turning ethereum into like a more mature protocol not just ethereum i think all the evm chains right and if you are a user what you need you don't need to upgrade anything for vectra or or for uf and if you are a regular solidity dev then i think you shouldn't need to prepare too much uh because uh, there is bus but yeah you have to learn about new upgrades and new stuff and new changes i think with this video you started that so yeah if the uf gets merged into vectra then as a dev you will have to learn new stuff so you know be prepared for that but right now i don't think so you will have to uh, do anything but yeah rejoice says you might not even encounter the stack too deep uh, error again okay <laughs> and uh, uf will operate in parallel to legacy evm smart contracts so you know there is no need to worry that uh, you have have to migrate right so evm uf evm is going to operate in parallel right so yeah i think this is the small conclusion and if you think that uh, this video was helpful then please 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 do share it on twitter it, uh, you know share share it with people share it with your community members who the fellows you are learning with and also uh, thank you also you can subscribe to the youtube channel if you're watching it on youtube if you're watching on twitter then uh, you can go to my youtube channel and uh, subscribe there and also follow me on twitter and there is a link to a telegram channel where i share a lot of stuff ranging from hackathons from fellowships from grant opportunities also sometimes job and internships so if you are looking if you're a web3 specific builder and if you're looking for opportunities uh right so please join that group and uh, yeah i also share some one on one uh, booking slots so you can take mentorship but thank you for watching and uh, do subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comment section if you liked it what can i improved and maybe what another next studio you want me to uh, create and also watch my other crash courses as well i've created multiple technical crash courses which might be useful so go and watch that uh, so yeah till that thank you so much take care